Digital Games also used to have an in-house game studio, like last year, but then we decided that it was better to fully focus on publishing games of developers. Um, so we actually already had everything in-house back then. Uh, we made the games ourselves, we had uh, the marketing team, advertising team, uh, user acquisitioners, uh, making sure that, uh, that they know all the uh, tips and tricks of the app store, stuff like that. And nowadays that's also what we offer to developers uh, whenever we buy the game, that we offer them like, you focus on the game, make it work, make it great, and we will take care of the promotion, marketing, um, app optimization, whatever. Um, so for us, it works best, you know, if we do the user acquisition and stuff like that, and the developers just focus on the game design, art, everything. Sounds good. Uh, and how about, uh, I'd just like to, to check what you think about, uh, I'm not sure, stuff with Chris, what do you think that, uh, when you're looking for, for, for game developers, and, and what, what's, well, what you look most, What's, what is the, well, the skill set that they need to have uh, to, to work with you or to work with VA? Yeah, I would say generally, I mean, who can give us the best gifts? Um, who takes us out for the best dinners and drinks? No? <laughs> um, so I think what we look for in our external partners, I mean, it's, it's a lot of different things. I already touched on it. Um, typically, a large organization like EA, it's hard to take a risk on a small company that maybe hasn't uh, isn't extremely mature in their processes, haven't done a lot of work with other large developers and publishers. So we like to work with companies that have that, uh, that track record. Um, but there's definitely some other fundamental things we look for. Um, obviously, we need to make sure that the company uh, meets our secure, very strict security rec uh, requirements. I won't get into any detail on that, but things like, uh, is there physical security? So can anybody just walk in the building and go to the production floor and see pictures from FIFA 2017 on the screen, right? Um, you know, are people restricted from plugging USBs in and taking photos and whatnot? So we have, we have very strict security, um, security requirements, um, as well very strict uh, requirements with our, with our legal, um, making sure that um, if we were to engage, that the vendor would be willing to sign a master services agreement, so on and so forth. I think most importantly, though, we look for companies that offer um, the skill sets that we need, that they have you know, real experts in some of these areas I mentioned, whether it's characters or concept art, um, uh, animation, um, and so forth, but also the ability to scale. So initially, when we engage with a company, uh, maybe we only need let's say seven artists for the first three months of the production, but we know that we're gonna to need to scale that up to you know, 30, 40, potentially 50. Um, that's very difficult for a small company. Um, so uh, a service provider that has that ability to scale, I think that's probably one of the most important um, things that we look for. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with um, what Chris mentioned, uh, but uh, specifically, I think I'll just touch on two areas. Uh, one, of course, is uh, is there at least one person uh, in your studio that can wow me with something? Uh, at the very least, if you want my attention, if you want me to look at you as a potential partner, just show me one thing that will wow me. Uh, and if you have the time, show me one thing from each discipline that will wow me. Uh, the second part that, um, uh, that I look for in an external partner uh, for, for Relic and for past uh, developers as well, is whether there's a uh, sense or strategy to lean towards debar departmentalization uh, or speciali specialization as well. So, I, like Chris, you touched on it as well. We're looking for people or groups or teams that have um, uh, a character team or environment team, um, have high level uh, principal artists or art directors that are uh, focused on mentoring and managing those teams. And, and the reason for that is we're a um, cross-discipline team ourselves. And when we talk about outsourcing, uh, we don't do conventional outsourcing. It's, it's not enough scope or scale for us uh, to bother with. We're looking at full integrated services where we have our uh, are replicated our internal pipeline externally with our partner 
so that their artists have the same advantages as our artists have in terms of uh, tech art support, um, our pipelines, uh, and the disciplines that help support our artists from uh, game designer to um, art directors, from uh, characters and environments, uh, and uh, all the other disciplines. I think I also agree with you on the part that they need to wow me because uh, what I find important when looking for a work for hire studios is that they have a strong portfolio uh, which is communing, uh, communicating very clear what they're strong at and what they're capable of and what they're looking for because I also want it to be a, a good match with each other. Um, but besides that, after seeing the art and what they're capable of, the team itself is really important for us. Uh, at Spill Games, uh, we find communication really important. We need to know if there's uh, a game designer in the team, a project manager, who are we going to talk to? And something that maybe we could introduce is the three Ps that we use in Spill. Uh, like, we like developers and studios who are proactive, professional and passionate about what they do. And that will easily transfer their passion for the games um, to us, which will make it a really nice cooperation. We don't want it to be like uh, so we, we're quite small in our uh, production team, like three game producers. We don't want it to be like that we're the, the big employer and that uh, the game studio is working for us. Uh, we're really keen on it that we're working together and that we could also share knowledge on this and learn together about maybe trying WebGL and Unity. Uh, who dares it? Okay, but learn about that together. Um, and to make sure that it's also a nice cooperation. And afterwards, if it was, then yeah. We want more. Okay, cool. Uh, you have talked a bit about like the, the student need to woe you and you need to be confident about them uh, to well to 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 build a, a long term relationship with them. Uh, here, specifically in Brazil and, and probably uh, abroad too, all game development students they well keep trying to create their own IP games and try and looking for publishers and they came to to well even like the the big so looking for publishers, and sometimes they do both things, so they also do outsourcing, uh, well, to keep the money flowing. Uh, I'd like to know what's your, what you, how do you see that? I think it's, it's good to, to, to all game students to have your vision about that, like, like no, do you think that's, uh, I think that's, it, it's going to work well, because I know that's, it's, it, it has like two different cultures, like when you're going to develop a game for, for another student, when you are going to develop your IP and that you are going to have, well, almost all revenue share and everything. Uh, this, do you believe that it's, 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 it works? Uh, you, you would like to, to well, hire some, some students like, like this? Well, in my case, as a cash flow game company, uh, we publish lots of games every day, because uh, maybe six a day. And uh, for us, it's... Um, That's a lot. <laughs> yes, yes, but it's a casual game, like small games, nothing compared to the, the big projects with mobile. So also work for higher projects with Spill uh, could last for one month, but maybe four months, but not, not a year, for example. Um, but I think for us, it's really important that developers do create their own content because it shows they're passionate and that they will do stuff that they like themselves. Uh, we'll also be able to see if they are able to think uh, from the audience and not only because the studio told them, or the publisher, but they can think of it themselves as well. Um, yeah, and it's also a good portfolio uh, to showcase. So, but yeah, if they only have work that they made for uh, publishers or people like uh, Relic or EA, that won't matter. For me, I just need to see what they're capable of and see how, who's, who's the team, and that's fine for them. That's good too. So that you can see their IP portfolio is going to help you too. It has benefits, okay. yeah, to see how they think on their own and what, what they like to do on their own. Yeah. Okay, cool. I, I think there's definitely benefit in working on an IP uh, or creating a new IP. I think uh, you get a lot of um, experience on the full production pipeline and, and I certainly want to work with a team that has a larger picture vision of development. Uh, and of course, uh, for a lot of companies, it can be a source of renewal, renewable income as well. Uh, but I don't want to um, uh, diminish the work for hire side of things because I've seen a lot of companies start up, especially in my time in China from 2006 all the way till now, uh, start up and 
work for hire was the way that they learned a lot about different types of technologies, um, kept up to date with um, the uh, technologies that were coming, uh, so upcoming technologies as well. And there's a lot of learning involved with uh, work for hire, and uh, especially with work for hire contracts. Um, uh, in my case, uh, I provide a lot of support for our external partners to get them ramped up and understand our technology. So that's definitely a way uh, to learn and to grow. Uh, and I think it's an advantage um, for any uh, external partner to, to do the work for hire uh, type work. Yeah, I mean, the, like one area can help no, the, the other one, like your IP could possibly help you well in the, in the, in the external development uh, projects because they're going to well know what works in terms of retention, monetization, and, and everything so you can get this expertise back to, to to understand our development and well in the same and vice versa so for sure okay. well let's let's see what Chris has to say about it I, I, I Delbert covered that very eloquently uh, I'll just um, at so Vincente are you asking because you're about to release your next big IP is this way <laughs> you're not sure so no, I, I really I'm asking uh, because uh, I have already heard uh, like the opposite uh, in the opposite way people say okay yeah. no uh, we really like to, to work with Students that only do external development, yeah, yeah. you know, because they can focus. If they have like, if they are uh, under pressure to release uh, uh, their IP games, maybe they are not going to be well full allocated in, in sure. our projects and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so from EA's perspective, I, I would say we're very selfish and that we would much prefer that the partner we work with is as much as possible focused on the work for hire on external development. Now, if that company does want to do their own game development, they want to create their own IP, we would prefer that that is, uh, not that they set up a, 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 a separate business necessarily, but that could be a very segmented area of the company. Or separate team. Se or separate, separate team, because what we don't want is for that to, let's say, pull resources from our project because you know vendor A has a milestone that they have to meet with their new IP, and then that puts our project at risk. Um, so that's a challenge. However, with what Dilbert said, um, and Astrid, I think you touched on this as well, there's definitely benefits to, um, let's say, an artist or an engineer that really has only had exposure to doing work for hire to get to work on a full game and to get to do a full pipeline. But at the same time, um, you know, a company could do a fun game on their own as training, but that doesn't need to be released uh, necessarily on the App Store or on Steam. That can just be an internal uh, project. So to come back, I would say, <laughs> From the from our selfish perspective, we would much prefer that the that the partner is focused on on work for hire. Uh, it, uh, well, it means that you like you had a problem in the past, maybe with well with some partner um, because of that because they have like all mixed teams, maybe. Uh, mm, not exactly. Maybe I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good answer. <laughs> uh, uh, Another thing that uh, I believe that it's, it's interesting for, for everyone, uh, I know that you do have like a, a kind of a due diligence process when you are going to, to, to talk uh, and, and start to, to meet and date in uh, a, a game studio. Uh, for example, for us that we also do is some development, it usually takes like months until we will start the relationship and then we start the due diligence process, we change a lot of information. Uh, how exactly it works for you? What do you demand in terms of information, in terms of like portfolio? Uh, how exactly it works? And it takes how many well months it takes or week, days for you? Are you referring to if like so if you were approaching a company like Relic or EA and yeah. you're wanting to work with us, what like how should you prepare and present yourself to that company? Yeah, Is that the question? Much is, yeah. Oh, for, for. Uh, on your vision? Or? So, I, being in this role for five years, I've seen a lot of presentations from service providers. A lot. And I would say the vast majority of them are not particularly good, and there's a small percentage that are exceptionally good. And those presentations that, let's say I meet somebody at GDC or at Big or at Casual Connect, I would say the ones that I'm most impressed with are those that are the most prepared. 
um, those that have actually done research, done homework. So who is EA? What games do we pub uh, develop? What games do we publish? Who am I? What are my interests? Oftentimes I come to the table and unfortunately the other person hasn't prepared very well and they yeah. might be presenting something to me that is unfortunately of no sometimes particular they interest. They are presenting their only big games for you. It's, it happens a lot. <laughs> yeah, it does, it does happen a lot and that's, and that's fine because sometimes they don't know that that's not necessarily what I'm interested in. But, uh, you know, if you're going to be approaching um, a developer and, uh, you know, trying to date them as you, as you put it and build that relationship, you know, you should bring a presentation to the table that very clearly shows, you know, when was my company founded? How many employees do we have? What are our core service offerings? Who are our clients? What projects have we worked on? Um, how are we departmentalized, as Dilber said? Um, and if you can express that in under 10 minutes and deliver a, a good, well-informed presentation, I, I'm immediately impressed, and I'm willing to continue the, the conversation. So for me, I think I think preparation and and, home, and people doing their homework uh, is very important. Yeah, I don't think I have anything to add to that. <laughs> but in terms of, of uh, uh, the time, well, the entire time to do like this due diligence, and fits well, if the company like uh, the game suit fits your needs, how how long it takes usually. Well, I mean, we constantly do due diligence throughout the year because there's so many different events. Uh, we get approached by uh, different partners looking to update us on their services uh, and, and what they're doing and what clients they've been working with, uh, what products are, are released that they've been working on. So uh, it's a constant process of due diligence uh, where we're checking up with uh, external partners. But uh, from my perspective, when I'm actually reaching out to an external partner uh, for a prospective work, uh, generally I, I start to do the due diligence about six months prior to production starting on, on my end. And then from there, we, it could take up to six months to nine months to actually start on anything that's related to uh, production. It might be a uh, a, a test of some sort. It might be a, a pilot production where we're testing scalability across multiple people um, and multiple disciplines. So, and then from there, if they get past that gate, um, we may enter into production. It can be up to a nine month process for me. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, at Spill Games, it's a, a, a bit different process. Um, to give some perspective, like I met a lot of people uh, yesterday and today um, and some are really uh, interesting studios and we, I think we could actually begin on our project like in one or two months so it could actually happen really fast but it will depend on their communication towards me and uh, on the time that I will have, it depends um, but yeah, it's definitely not six or nine months in our case <laughs> That's that long uh, in terms of, uh, I believe that you have already worked with, with teams from uh, like everywhere, so, so many different countries and, and continents. Uh, like, what do you, what do you, well, think of all cultural aspects and, and like, well, the timing aspects because sometimes you need to work with teams that like is ten uh, or or more hours ahead of you. How you handle that? All the cultural stuff. Uh, the, and the time um, difference too? Um, I never have any trouble with that because I've worked with people from uh, Asia, China, Indonesia, uh, East Europe, but there's not a big time difference because we're based um, near Amsterdam. Uh, yeah, I don't know, I never have any problems with it. We Skype, we email, and then when I wake up, I have an email from them and I will email them back and in a few hours they will read it. So yeah, and we've been working with people from all over the world, so. It, we do prefer to work with studios in our kind of time zone. We do. If it's a big work for hire project, yeah, then we, we prefer that. Yeah, I kind of like the idea of um, having the 12 hour difference or um, another time zone, working with somebody in another time zone because I can relax in the evening, take a nap, go to sleep, wake up in the morning, and then have all these issues that I can solve throughout the day. Um, and meet with the different uh, groups within my company to um, address those issues. 
and then get back to a partner uh, at the end of my day, which is the beginning of their day. Um, I think that's fantastic. At the same time, uh, we do work uh, globally as well and locally uh, with different partners and I find that the advantage for working with someone in the same time zone is that, um, or at least a, a majority of overlap between our time zones, uh, is that uh, we can do um, more collaborative work. So when, we, when we're thinking of doing something that's similar to code development uh, or research and development where we need to uh, work back and forth, uh, I think uh, having a bit more overlap is, uh, is important. But when we're doing large scale art production, for example, uh, uh, the, the, the time difference is, is a blessing. That's good. So I'm gonna focus on the cultural piece that you asked me about because working across cultures, that's probably one of the most challenging um, things for us. I mean, you know, for example, in my studio in Vancouver, we work on the NHL hockey game and outside of Canada, even in the US, hockey isn't, you know, largely understood. Um, so imagine trying to explain hockey to an art director in Suzhou, China. Um, there might be some things lost in translation. So one of our th the things that our teams at EA do, um, and it's pretty much a standard, is we, we visit the partners that we work with, and we visit them very often, uh, maybe once every three months, every four months. Um, but not only we go to visit them, we bring them to come and visit us. And, uh, you know, um, I was speaking to the art director on Dragon Age uh, last week, a guy by the name of Dave Lamb, and uh, he travels to St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, to meet with uh, one of our vendors there fairly regularly. And he says the absolute best thing you can do to, like, close the culture gap is just go out drinking. You know, you just, you go out, you have fun, you know, you meet these people, and oftentimes you meet their families. Um, but, you know, after you have that experience, then you have a really good rapport, you've got a really good relationship, and that really helps, you know, break down that communication gap. Um, but there still tends to be, you know, big cultural challenges. Just one quick uh, story. Um, so there's a, a American um, football, like football game that we make called, oh, that's, that's yeah, not football. called uh, Madden. Madden is our, one of our biggest titles. We've been making it for years and years and years. And the Madden team was working with a vendor in uh, Kiev, in the Ukraine. And there's this thing that happens in American football called a tailgate party. Do you guys know this tailgate? So everybody, before the football game, they get together outside of the stadium, and they drink beer, and they have a party, and they cheer on their team. Um, so we were telling the vendor that they have to create you know, props and assets that people can use in a tailgate party, trying to explain this to Ukrainians in Kiev, this concept, and it's like completely lost. But when you can go and visit and then you can have the face-to-face, -face, you they very quickly then understand what you're trying to communicate. So to close that cultural gap, I would say travel and visiting is probably one of the most key ingredients to a successful uh, external development relationship. Yeah, I agree. We have a, a, a related problem with that. Like uh, with the time zone, at least for us, it's, it's, it's okay. Sometimes we work with like a Japanese company. All our meetings are like at here at 11 p.m., but it's okay for us. But I believe that the cultural stuff, at least for us, is really huge. It is, at least for Japanese, for example, every week you had to report for them and you kind of ask for that. Okay, let's let's establish like at least weekly reports so you can, well, tell how the game is, is, is going, and well, tell you the updates and the new features they have implemented and everything. And you can send us your feedback, so I uh, do that by Skype. And I'm talking, presenting, and our team is well, really engaged in that and talking in there. Okay. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> and just like that, they, they, they even smile. It's like, okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think, and that comes yeah. back to what I was saying about traveling and building a, a rapport, a good relationship. I'll just touch on time zone very quickly. So, yes, time zone is always a challenge. To our teams, we use time zone as an advantage. I'm sure you guys probably do as well. Um, so if we're working with a partner in China, they're doing their work while we're sleeping. We come in the next morning, 
we get to review, we have the full day to review that work, send the feedback, and then they get up the next day, and then they can read the feedback and continue working. So when you have a good working relationship like that, and good trust, then we can really take advantage of that 24-hour development cycle. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to um, add to what Chris was saying about being on site and how it's important. I, I just take it for granted because for almost every project that I've worked on in the last 10 years, I've always been on site, uh, especially for um, two key uh, points of uh, mitigating risk, which is at the ramp up of the project where we have a small group of people learning our pipeline and our expectation for four to six weeks. So I'll be on site with the team just to close those gaps. And then also during peak production when we're scaling aggressively, uh, just to make sure that that knowledge that we're retained, um, the knowledge that we that the team learned in the early period uh, is retained and transferred on to the, to the new people. So I gen I'm generally uh, on site for any project 50% of the time. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I have a specific, a specific question. Uh, it, it's good to know like how, how long it takes, about the due diligence process, and everything. Uh, whether, uh, it's, it's good also to know, especially for our, our game developers over here. How do you believe that's uh, the, the best way that they should approach you, like email, cold calls, LinkedIn, well, conference and events like big festival, or maybe no, uh, we are going to approach them. <laughs> Well, what, what, what do you think about that? How, how do you prefer to, 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 well, to be approaching? If I could, every time I would prefer at conferences so I can meet them in real life immediately. Um, but besides that, uh, email is fine and they can just approach me. It's really just yeah, informal, to be honest. Uh, emails makes it a bit harder to make a good impression because sometimes the emails can look really um, yeah, like a template that they just filled in spill games, look at my game. Uh, so that's why I prefer in person. Uh, but yeah, that's not always possible for developers, but also not for me, I'm not going uh, everywhere. Um, so yeah, they can approach us. I will approach them if I am able to find them somewhere. And I think uh, any kind of uh, uh, medium to approach me is just fine. Do you have a, like an active process to, to do that? Like keep looking, uh, they make you or your team keep looking for, for for studios and, and get in touch with them, it, it happens? Yeah, like browsing through um, uh, websites like from Big, see which developers will be here, or Cash Look Connect, Game Connect, whatever. Um, I also look on uh, websites online where they sell games, and then I will be like, okay, well, what kind of developers we have now? And of course, talking with the developers, they, they love to share with what their friends are making, and they will share it with me, and then I will discover a new studio. So. Yeah, and, and well, and deeper. Yes. Talk, yeah, talk a little bit. Sorry, no. <laughs> how, how, how it is no, I, for I'm, I'm more than uh, open to all forms of interaction. Like uh, I think it's great that uh, um, the, the vendors are being proactive and reaching out to me, whether it's over email or wanting to have a quick conference call or, or just wanting to update me. Um, generally, uh, if I have a need, then I will reach out to external partners, uh, but uh, otherwise, it's good to have just every once in a while um, someone reach out to me, and I, I think it's great because uh, it shows that um, they're making an effort, and I've even had uh, partners that have um, come through Vancouver to go to, say, GDC, and they'll stop by Vancouver uh, just to have a chat with me, and I think that's great, just to, to talk to them in person to help to build that relationship. Good. Uh, yeah. uh, but like last week before I left to Sao Paulo, there was some guy from Slovakia who I had never done business with, but I knew him from email a little bit. And then he told me, well, Astrid, I'm coming to Amsterdam. Can I visit your company? And then we Maybe. just did it. Yeah, well, it's fine. You know, if they're coming my way and you want to meet, then it's fine. And now probably we're going to do business together because I met him. And it's in a person. good connection. Yeah, yeah, good yeah I, I, I believe that when meeting person, it's, it's way better. Uh, that's why I'm really excited about the, the XDS. Uh, we have a, a, sh a short video. I'd like uh, I know, ask the technical guys. It's also a spot like a, a video. And then, well, ask later Chris to talk a little bit about the XDS. Let's rock. Yeah. 
So this is an event that uh, Dilber and I are involved in in Vancouver. Uh, it's called the External Development Summit, or XDS, and it's the only event globally that focuses on exactly what we're talking about today, um, external development, formerly known as outsourcing. So it's a small event of 400 that brings together industry professionals like us to hold presentations and panel discussions around the really scary challenges that we have as a games industry to do external development, but we also bring about 120 service providers uh, to that event as well. So it's a fantastic opportunity to network. Um, and this is happening in September, uh, this September in Vancouver, uh, 9 to 11. And I've heard there's about seven companies from Brazil uh, that are attending XDS, if that's correct. Um, so it's gonna be the Brazilian invasion in Vancouver um, in, a, in a few months, which I'm very excited for. I don't, Dilber, anything you wanna add to this? Uh, basically, uh, I started with XDS about a year ago, and um, I was invited to a pre-summit event called XDS Ignite that happens at GDC, and it was a, a very close, um, uh, event where a lot of the uh, studios got together, developers got together to talk about external development and what are their challenges and concerns. And at first, I thought, you know, I know everything there is to know about external development. I've been doing it for years. Um, like, what else is there to offer? And when I went to the event, I realized that um, that wasn't the case. There are a lot of people today that are at different levels in terms of their interactions with external partners and how they're utilizing external development, and I was sitting next to um, a person from Sony who had a very different outlook on utilizing external development, and uh, he was doing a much larger scope and scale that I've ever worked with in my entire life, and I thought, wow, there are people here that even I can learn from, and from that moment on, I made a commitment to helping uh, XDS and with Chris uh, with the summit, uh, and also to, to, work, to work, reach out to people like you, uh, external partners as well, uh, to help improve uh, external development for everyone. And I'm, I'm really excited about this event because usually at like GDC, Capital Connect, Game Connection, and every one of those conferences, you need to, um, well, we that we work for, uh, like external development, you need to filter which conference is going to be, uh, well, looking for external development partners, and it's usually just uh, like, a small portion of that, and now it's our, our events completely dedicated to that, so 100% standard development, so it's going to be amazing. I'd like to open for questions, which, well, I have just like a few minutes, one or two minutes, but I'd like to open for questions, and Chris, I, I believe that needs to be kidnapped by the, uh, by Fernanda. <laughs> I'm judging the contest. Yeah, that's why. I can speak for EA and Chris. Yeah. Yeah, just like that. Uh, thank you, Chris. So it's open. Anyone has uh, uh, any questions? Okay, there's one over here. Yeah, okay, just, you can just say, it's okay. I've done a little bit of research on, on your website and, and I've seen that you have different platforms for different types of games and uh, different de demographics. Uh, my question is, uh, are you open for different, uh, depending on the type of game, uh, are you open for, uh, you can qualify for different of those platforms or just one or? Um, it depends. Uh, so you're talking about uh, the boys' website, the girls' website, and the family. Yeah. Uh, there are many games that can uh, cater to uh, multiple platforms. If there's uh, like a really fun bubble shooter game that also has like a cute theme to it, we can publish it on uh, three of our platforms, three of our biggest. Uh, but sometimes if it's more of a niche, like a boys' game with some shooting, then it will probably only go online on one, one platform. But that doesn't um, uh, minimize the chance to be um, to work together with Spill. You know, we find it it's fine if it's only on one platform. It's, if it uh, can be on three, then it's even better. 
Great. I believe we still have a time for one more question. Okay, over here. Like you mentioned that you like to work with other companies as outsourcing, but what about individuals like programmers or artists and, and stuff? Do you do you actually reach out to them or is not in your interest? Um, at Spill Games at the moment, we're not looking for just one artist or one programmer to work with us. Um, I'm not excluding it from the future. Who knows if we might need a certain style that the studio doesn't have. Um, so yeah, maybe sound and music, we do that. We sometimes work with companies that can make the type of music that we want, but not this year. Yeah, for, for Relic, I think it's challenging because the, like, the type of outsourcing that we do isn't really conventional outsourcing anymore. It's uh, external development or distributed development. So we're looking to distribute our internal pipeline, our technology, uh, Perforce build servers um, for our partners to work with as well. So doing that with contractors and individuals, uh, it's a little bit more challenging from a legal perspective. I think uh, we couldn't get approval on that. But having said that, again, with sound and audio for sure, we do work with uh, contractors that are outside of the city, um, you know, especially if they're, if they're talented and, and uh, we, need their, we need their support for our project, definitely. Great, I think that we, we run out of time already. I'd just like to mention that uh, if you, any, any one of you get interested on, on XDS and, and know more about, well, please talk with Dilbert, Chris, or also with the Abra Game guys. Uh, Abra Games has a partnership with XDS, so part of the cost is, is, is paid by Abra Games, so, well, talk with them, talk with Fanada, and, and, well, know more about the event. Well, I'd like to uh, say thank you for you all. Thank you for all, well, important and amazing info. Uh, well, and thank you. Thank you a lot, Dibber. Thank you a lot, Ashley.